I think Micro Four Thirds is a great camera system. You've got the small size for portability, you've got the crop factor for doing wildlife photography. Typically you've great IBIS and you've a lot of options on the second hand market, but it's pretty susceptible to noise, which is what a lot of people like to point out about the system. I mean, pretty much every camera system is going to give you noise when you get up into high ISOs, but for Micro Four Thirds in particular, yeah, it's pretty susceptible. Today I'm going to cover how I denoise my Micro Four Thirds images, how I shoot to avoid noise, and does noise even matter? Let's jump in. I suppose the first thing we should talk about is what is noise. Have you ever taken an image in a blank enough space, a bit like this, and you just notice grain? Almost like you're shooting with a high ISO film. Well, that's noise. Uh, and you're gonna find it a lot in your shadows and it can just sap detail from an image. Typically, this is related to shooting at a high ISO. Uh, think of ISO as like gain you're applying to your camera sensor. Have you ever plugged your phone into a PA system or a speaker and you've got the volume turned kind of down on your phone but you turn up the volume on the actual speaker? Well, you're just gonna get hiss. We're just turning up the ISO and that's just gonna add noise to our image. It's a bit of an oversimplification but that's your kind of basic noise, right? But have you ever had this? just little specks of green or purple on your image. That kind of color noise, in my experience anyway, is typical of when the actual camera sensor is getting a bit hot. And that doesn't mean shooting out in the desert or shooting in anywhere besides Ireland. That means just you're kind of using it for a long time. So if you're doing astrophotography or just kind of long exposures in general, you're gonna notice this. How do we get rid of noise before we even take the picture? Well, decreasing your ISO is gonna be your best bet. Your ISO is one third of your exposure triangle, which means if you wanna bring that down, you're gonna to have to either slow your shutter speed or let in more light through your aperture. Fast lenses are gonna be your low light warriors. This lens here opens up to f1.7, which means it lets in a lot of light. Your kit lens probably only opens up to about f3.5 to f5.6, depending on where you're zoomed in. And this is just gonna get more light onto your camera sensor, meaning that you can decrease your ISO. But of course, shooting with your aperture wide open has some disadvantages too. Most lenses aren't as sharp as they can be when you're shooting wide open. And you're gonna decrease your depth of field. You might actually want more stuff in focus. So opening up all the way to f1.7 might not be the best idea. So you can slow your shutter speed. This is really nice and easy to do if you have a body with really good in-body stabilization or IBIS. My Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II, a bit of a mouthful, uh, has amazing IBIS and so does my Lumix G9. I can handhold both of those for about two seconds and get a shot that's, you know, sharp and nice. And if you combine that with a lens that's stabilized, like the Lumix 12 to 60, 12 to 32, some of the Olympus Pro lenses, then you're gonna be able to handhold for much, much longer. But if that's still not long enough, you may need a tripod or a railing or a fence or just something you can put the camera on to take the shot. But of course then, if you have something in your scene that's gonna be moving and you might not want that. I was out shooting a Gaelic football game earlier in autumn and it was pretty dark outside, not pitch black, but kind of like late into blue hour. I was shooting with a lens that didn't really open up that much. I was shooting with my 100 to 300 at its widest aperture, which I think is like f5.6 because I was at the longer end of the lens. I wanted to do sports photography. I really like a fast shutter so that the ball itself doesn't blur. So I had only one option and that was to raise my ISO on my G9. I decided to extend ISO so I could go all the way to 25,600. And even then my images were a bit underexposed. Pretty much the simplest way to denoise an image is with the denoising sliders in Lightroom. You have two sliders, luminance and color. Luminance will be your kind of just sort of that regular grainy noise we talked about. And color will be more for your like little specks that you get when shooting at long exposures. Uh, but also I find that you kind of want to have a bit of that on your slider anyway. These typically do a really good job for everyday images that are a bit noisy. And what I mean by that is if you're out shooting with your camera and you might be at ISO 3200, ISO 6400, it's just a bit noisy. Do you know what I mean? Particularly on Micro Four Thirds, if you're at about ISO 6400 on the older bodies anyway, like I have, you're gonna have a bit of noise. Lightroom and Lightroom Classic back in 2023, I think it was, got AI enhancing. So you can use this to denoise and you can use it to kind of upscale your image. This is pretty easy to do. You just right click on your image, go to enhance, and by default, it's gonna select denoise. And you have a slider. That slider is for your like denoising amount. And it's gonna be very tempting to whack it up to 100. I think when you do that, you end up with images that look kind of plasticky, overly smooth, and they look like an AI generated image. So what I do recommend is just moving your preview slider around the place to get a rough idea of what things are gonna look like uh, before you denoise. 
Depending on your computer, this can take a while. I've heard people say it can take five minutes. I have a little Mac Mini that I use as like my editing workstation, and it does it in about 30 to 40 seconds. I will say, pay attention to people's faces in particular. We're humans, we've evolved to know what a human face looks like, and if they're a bit too smooth or something, it just looks really weird. Note that this actually creates a new file. It doesn't apply this denoising to your original image. Adobe calls this file a DNG plus. Uh, and what that means is it's already enhanced in Lightroom. So you can't take an image that you enhanced with denoising and then try and upscale it with super resolution. That won't work. There's ways around this. You can denoise your image with the AI enhancing, right click it to edit it in Photoshop, save it then in Photoshop so it comes back into Lightroom as a TIFF, and then you can upscale that if you want. It's a bit of a faff, and to be honest, I don't really find that I want to upscale my image and denoise them. Another option I use is Topaz. So Topaz can actually do a lot besides denoising. It can sharpen images, it can upscale them, it can recover blurred faces if someone like moves a bit when the picture is being taken. But today I'm only going to focus on denoising. So Topaz is an extra purchase. That's just something to be aware of. You can find it for about $200, uh, but it's often on sale at stuff like Black Friday, they'll do like winter sales, that sort of stuff. So so by default, when you bring an image into Topaz, it's going to run what it calls autopilot. So it's going to scan the image and see, okay, is it blurred? Does it need to be sharpened? And it's going to choose an algorithm it thinks will denoise it best. But if you're not happy with the result, you can choose a specific denoising algorithm and you can choose intensity levels there. And there are other options in Topaz. Remember in Lightroom how if we had used the AI denoising, we couldn't then get it to upscale, you know, without a bit of a workaround. Here at Topaz, all at once, we can denoise the image, sharpen it if it's blurred, we can upscale it, and we were cover faces and then you can export that in pretty much every file type imaginable you can even export it as a DNG just to bring back into Lightroom then and edit that's my preferred workflow I know some people like to do all their editing in Lightroom and then take the JPEG and then bring that into Topaz but I kind of I don't know, my preferred workflow is do your denoising and then bring it into Lightroom. One thing about Topaz that I will say is that when you bring in your raw file into it, it looks like it has a lot more noise. For those that don't know, like your raw file is just the raw data your sensor captured. And every program on your computer is going to interpret that data differently. And in Topaz, it just seems to have more noise in the preview. Uh, some people have said that Topaz does this so that the results seem more impressive. But to be honest, the results are pretty impressive anyway, so I'm not really sure. Uh, it is one-off payment, so you pay once for your $200, and then I think you get a year of updates, and then you can buy another year of updates if you want, but you can use the version you've bought, you know, indefinitely. So that's how I remove noise, but honestly, I want to talk about noise for a second. In the images I was showing you how to denoise, yeah, they were pretty extreme examples. You know, they were shot at like ISO 25,600 in the dark. A lot of the time, some images are just a bit noisy and they don't look that bad. If the first thing you see in an image is noise, then the image isn't doing a good job showcasing what the image is. You know what I mean? I like to treat noise reduction software like a wrist strap. So whenever I'm out shooting with a camera, I have this wrist strap on it. That's not to help me grip the camera. That's just on the off chance I drop the camera into the ocean that I have something there stopping it. I don't like to shoot at super high ISOs thinking, ah, I'll just denoise it afterwards. But if the situation demands that I have to shoot at them super high ISOs, well then I do have the option to denoise there. But if your image is going to be shrunk down to like three inches by three inches for social media, then that's not, you know, noise isn't that big of an issue there. And if you're printing for an exhibition, the paper itself can do a good job of hiding the noise. If you're shooting on like a matte paper or a kind of canvas or canvas effect paper, the actual texture of that does a pretty good job at kind of eliminating the noise, analog noise reduction, if you will. There are more noise reduction tools out there besides, you know, Lightroom and Topaz. It's just most people, I think, use Lightroom and Topaz seems to be a pretty good noise reduction tool I've seen a lot of people talking about. But I do wonder, people have kind of become nostalgic for that grainy look of film, right? That you'd get if you were shooting at like a high ISO or if you're shooting at a low ISO and you brought it up in the darkroom. And with Digicams kind of making a little bit of a comeback for their kind of like digital glitchiness. I do wonder if in like 10 years we're going to become nostalgic for digital noise. Like in 10 years with like how AI noise reduction is going with, you know, just software improvements in camera, I think noise is going to slowly disappear. I think in a few years we're going to have an option to batch import images and we're going to see software going, oh, high ISO noise, it's been denoised for you. And I think noise is going to become a thing of the past, and I wonder if we're going to become nostalgic for it. Have you tried any noise reduction software, and what do you think of it? Um, have you used one that's different to what I've recommended? 
Uh, if so, I'd actually like to hear about that. Thanks for checking out my video. If you like this video, please give it a like. And if you want to see more stuff like this, please subscribe. I upload new videos on photography and micro four thirds every Thursday at 3 p.m. Irish time. You can click my face to subscribe or you can click somewhere around here to see one of my most recent uploads. Cheers.